Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's executive producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel from the I Miss in the Morning Show. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, and also from the New York Post. <laughs> Michael's so excited he's been doing I Miss. He's been on five times. I'm, I'm bringing oh. Broadway and high culture to shock jock radio. <laughs> to people who don't want to know about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> but it's so interesting to be on a show that actually gets ratings, too, for the first time. So <laughs> What's amazing. that like, Michael? <laughs> I'll tell you guys later. But, Susan, we are at the start of a new season on Broadway. And as always, at the beginning of a new season, we like to take a look to see what's coming, what's going to be a hit, what's going to be a flop, and where the controversies are. And we are joined by our esteemed panel of uh, prognosticators. <laughs> Jesse Green from New York Magazine, welcome. I'm just steamed. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Jesse, you're always writing some very interesting, thoughtful, uh, well-crafted pieces about theater people. What are, you right. working, what are you working on? <laughs> what are you working on now? Nothing about theater, and thank God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Michael Musto from The Village Voice, welcome back, Michael. With the new book out. With the new book out. <laughs> Work on the left, knife in the back. This has been just any longer than Spider-Man was. <laughs> uh, and this is a culmination of 27 years at the Village Voice. 27 years of columns. I need a gold watch or discount tickets to Chinglish or something. <laughs> <laughs> What's great about writing a book like this is you don't really have to write it. You just assemble it. It's right? basically collating. <laughs> yeah. Collating. Right. But I did write some original essays as well, and it's just flying off the racks. Absolutely. It's a fork <laughs> on the left, knife in the back. And also by our old friend and our short friend, Patrick <laughs> Pacheco. And of, getting shorter all the time, And shrinking all the time of New York One and the Los Angeles Times. And Patrick, I do, before I start, want to clear up one thing. Yes. You were deeply offended recently at the American Theater Wing dinner because Susan snubbed you. I know, but she was talking to a donor. Yeah, but so it was it's, unbelievable. It's, it's we were there, hi, how are you? And she turned on you <laughs> as if you were Mr. Cellophane. <laughs> I can understand that, but it was one of the best American theater wings. I, I don't ever know attended. what you both are talking about, but I'm so flattered that you're talking about me now. <laughs> <laughs> let's go for it. All right, let's talk. Let's start with the, the, the controversy of the season so far. Uh, there Ooh. is a big revival of Porgy and Bess coming to Broadway. First time, I think it's been on Broadway since it was done in the 30s. And Patrick. And uh, we it, have to say it's. The Gershwin's Porgy. The Gershwin's Porgy. And, and Patrick, changed. it nearly got derailed because of a letter Steve Sondheim wrote to the New York Times. Just give us the background on this controversy. Don't piss off God. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the lesson to learn. Diane Paulus and Audrey McDonald, uh, who are two of the creative team, Diane Paulus directing Audrey McDonald. Uh, Suzanne Laurie Parks. Also, Suzanne Laurie Parks writing the book, and Norm Lewis starring as, as Porgy with Audrey McDonald. Uh, they gave an interview to the New York Times in which they talked about having to take these two-dimensional characters, as they put it, and make them more three-dimensional. And I th believe that that was one of the reservations that Audrey McDonald had in terms of taking on that role. Um, and it did need work. It was a book, obviously, by DuBose Hayward. And Sondheim's a, an extraordinary champion of DuBose Hayward. Uh, you could tell that from his book, the first volume of lyrics yeah. that just came Finishing out. The hat, yeah. That was one of the first names that he mentioned in, in very admiring terms. And he took out after them, not because of the production necessarily, because he hadn't seen the production, mm -hmm. but he, he took issue with the fact that somehow they were going to improve something that he felt didn't need improve. And call it and the Gershwin's Porgy and well, Bess, leaving the both Hayward out of it. They had no that, choice in yeah. that. That's right. The, that's the right, state, uh, yes. in whatever manner they managed to make that happen, eliminated DeBose Hayward and his wife, who had both contributed to the to the work uh, from the official title. I, wow. I got a sense, um, Jesse, when I read Sondheim's, and it was a blistery letter, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. pouring sarcasm over these people who thought they were going to improve what he considers a masterpiece, mm -hmm. and the condescending attitude they had to it. I had a sense, though, the subtext of that letter was Steve is in his 80s now. He's not going to be with us forever. I thought he was putting everyone on, on warning. <laughs> when I'm not here, don't mess with my stuff. But the truth is he's, he's quite willing to let directors do all kinds of things with his work. Yeah, but not re with but not re approval. Right, and not rewrite But he's it. alive and he's That's giving right. approval. George Gershwin isn't. And I think the really galling thing, and I'm totally with Sondheim on this, is that Diane Papalis acted like she had a direct line to Gershwin. Yes. <laughs> I've checked my Twitter page. I've checked my text. There's nothing from Gershwin lately. He's not communicating. <laughs> with anybody so this is absurd <laughs> and also the idea that we need more context and a happier ending what are we going to rewrite you're in town so everybody holds it in 
<laughs> and we don't need to add, you know, I'm crippled because, I'm well, a crack addicted whore because. <laughs> Leave it to the imagination. I think the old Porgy and Bess is becoming public domain. Yeah, yeah. So they want to restamp Porgy and oh, Bess as so the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess to make money. I'd rather get the old one for free than pay for this new one. Yes. But having seen the Trevor Nunn production in London about three or four years ago, I came away from watching that production thinking, wow, this book does need some work. I, 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 I wouldn't take issue with Diane Paulus or Suzanne Laurie Parks needing to punch up this book and perhaps make it a little bit more... So you're involving. on their side, but... Well, you and, well and, and, I, I think that they're, they're, they both have legitimate arguments, but I think the lesson to be learned is don't talk to the New York Times or be really anemic, and the fact that when God speaks or smotes, uh, <laughs> every critic had to take... Sondheim into consideration in reviewing the production. But, but this was interesting though because this triggered then Ben Brantley going out of town to Boston to review a show that was booked for New York. The first time the New York Times has ever reviewed a show on the way to New York and he gave it a mixed review which hurt the show. Investors got cold feet from that show. From, from the, that review, yeah. He wrote a love review. letter to Audrey McDonald, who's always wonderful. Mm, yeah. But he took into consideration sometimes criticisms of what was it fair? Was, a reality. was that fair for him to, for Brantley to do that, Jesse? Well, I don't think there's any fair anymore in in reviewing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. you you really those those standards are out the window years ago. Sure, it became a news story. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in a way, the Times would have looked ridiculous if it didn't cover it. But uh, the the real issue I think Michael was was pointing to is it's really about what the estates want. Mm -hmm. uh, they still have control over the material, and they wanted a new version of this that could play in uh, places that were not opera houses, places that didn't have. A 60 piece orchestra and a huge cast like that. And something that didn't run three hours and 45 right. minutes. Right, so they wanted something that could be revived a million times across the country. Again, it's a very hard show to do. They authorized this, they approved of it. Sondheim, I think, rightly was concerned about the way it was being talked about, but the beef is really with the, with the owners of the copyright. Who want to get the cash because the, the copyrights run out. All right, moving along to another, as Susan calls them, reimaginings. I didn't, I, that's not my, that's <laughs> not my silly <laughs> phrase. All right. We have another old show on a clear day you can see forever, bringing Harry Connick Jr. back to Broadway. This, too, I, with the approval of the estates, <laughs> Alan J. Lerner and Burton Lane. This has been completely rewritten, and you've seen it, Patrick. I have. So can you tell us what they have done? Well, I saw it at Vassar in a workshop last summer, and they have done both a gender change, and at Vassar they had done a racial change as well. Um, so the they, girl they was really, black. Yeah, yeah. The girl, uh, Daisy, is now Davy, uh, a male who goes to the psychiatrist. Uh, there's a person I'm already person confused. <laughs> 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 if you remember the original, Barbara Harris, and then Barbara Streisand in the movie, wants to quit smoking. So she goes to a psychiatrist who, in the process of hypnotizing her, she regresses to a past life, which right. was Melinda, Melinda Wayne Whistle in England, England in, yeah, yeah. in the 1800s. So now it's a man. It's now a man who used to be a woman. It, so it's that's right. It's very Chaz Bono. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> But it's a gay man, you know. I, I saw I saw the workshop, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. I wasn't there as press. But this is a show with a lovely score. It's not a show that you hear a lot. No, no one's and complaining about them revising it. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Sondheim has not weighed in on this one. It, it needed revising, uh, and, and no one has argued that that's a, a disdainful comment to make about it. The book was ridiculous. And you can never have enough gays on Broadway. But the, <laughs> but the score is gorgeous. gorgeous. They've added more songs by Burton Lane and Alan J. Lerner, and. Again, the estate, I'm sure, is not unhappy if what they end up with is a producible property. Basically. Because what they've had up to now it was viable anywhere, really. Yeah. Pretty so much. Redone it. Um, it, it this, the history of the show is interesting, though, and the reason it was such a crazy show. I got this from uh, Bobby Lewis, the original director. They worked on a show on Alan J. Lerner's yacht, and one of the <laughs> guests... I think that's already a, a bad start. <laughs> and one of the guests on the yacht was Max Jacobs, Jacobson, oh, yeah. Dr. Feelgood. Uh, and as they would sit around the table, Dr. Feelgood would give them yeah. all shots. So the joke was, this is a show about ESP written by people on LSD. Well, <laughs> if only Spider-Man was written on a yacht. <laughs> I was going to say, can, can we blame Flower Drum Song? Uh, <laughs> that? Yes, exactly. <laughs> all right, uh, now a revival that is up and running that I think is really terrific and is actually grossing over a million dollars a week, the first time in its history, is Stephen Sondheim's Follies. Uh, has Follies time finally come after all these years, Patrick? Well, I think it, it was a, a function of a couple of things. Number one, 
to have an orchestra of 28 and a cast of 41. I don't know With how that the, playing that gorgeous score. Yeah, I don't know how those numbers actually work. They've just extended for three weeks be, beyond their their announced time. Um, and I think people, I think it, it demonstrates the hunger that people have for something that they can actually sink their teeth in, in terms of a show being about something and a glorious score. I mean, yeah. about cynical, uh, 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 that's Michael, about surprising. cynical, d depressed people who hate, <laughs> married who hate each other. And they really <laughs> went for the darkness in this production. I mean, Elaine Page rips into I'm Still Here. Bernadette Peters plays her part like a total looney tune, <laughs> one step away from a straitjacket, <laughs> and she pulls it off with her brilliance. And Jan Maxwell goes for the hurt and the anger. And you're devastated by the end of it. Uh, yeah. And also uplifted by the music and the, the feathers and boas. <laughs> but, but, but in the original, which I, I, I must admit I, I saw as a mere girl, uh, they, they, <laughs> oh, they, they, that it was equally as devastating. I mean, Hal Prince had set it up. and they But that's really exactly what people that. didn't like about it back in 1971, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that right. it was yeah. too dark, too upsetting. The businessman coming after work didn't want to see his own marriage dissected <laughs> that right. way. But apparently now we're in a mood to hate ourselves. <laughs> Um, you, I went, as long I, as it's done beautifully. <laughs> I, I went the other night, uh, grosses of over a million dollars, unheard of for a Sondheim show. And the audience, uh, they were not, uh, it was not a bunch of show queens. These, they, they were tourists there going to see Follies. Wait, you and were there? <laughs> <laughs> and if he had only heard about the grosses before he wrote that letter, he wouldn't have written that letter. He would have been so happy. But I tell you, that audience was, they were riveted because yeah. it, the acting is so good. This, this show mm -hmm. is... Better than I, better than it's ever been, really. And I think what was it, Michael, who said the fact that there really isn't anything like that right yeah. now. Adult, uh, yeah. And for people to sink their teeth into, was that you, Patrick? Yeah. yeah. Um, was, and and you. with the, all the riches that are that can be afforded now, which are not as many as could be afforded <laughs> then, but still plenty. Uh, right. On display. Well, uh, now another adult show coming is Bonnie and Clyde, mm. a new musical. Your, your favorite by, composer by oh. Frank Wildhorn. Um, Explain, Patrick, to me the phenomenon of Frank Wildhorn. Here's a guy who's been on Broadway, what, five or six times? Every, five or six times, every single time, he is flattened by the critics. The critics despise this guy and his music. And yet, here he comes again with Bonnie and Clyde. I admire his resilience. He's like one of those blow-up dolls with a weighted bottom where you punch and it just comes right back at you. <laughs> uh, and this is one more time. Although this show got pretty good reviews, and it also is starring Jeremy Jordan, who just got really good reviews. For Newsies, in Newsies, New Jersey, yeah. as well. So this may make a star out of him. Certainly the subject matter is something of a brand name because of the film, uh, Bonnie and Clyde. You know, in this version, they're focusing on the romance more than the psychopaths oh, so doing, committing crimes. They're focusing on the on the romance. So, so Clyde won't Romeo and Clyde? I think mean, Clyde, <laughs> well, I, I, Clyde I the real life Clyde was impotent. I saw a priest, And bisexual. Yes, and bisexual. Yes. Oh, right, bisexual. God, we're not doing that. Right, he's dead, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, he, now, shot, he shot blanks. Michael, okay. can you, can, you know, Michael, can you make the case for the music of Frank Wildhorn? I actually like a lot of oh. the music. However, I have to go to a, wow. meet and greet, a, a meet and greet for Bonnie and Clyde in a couple of days, and I'm dreading having to run into him because <laughs> Wonderland was Blunderland. That was god awful. And I know Linda Ader, his ex wife, who turned down the part of the Mad Hatter, <laughs> uh, <laughs> feels the score was great. Everything else sucked. The whole thing sucked. Uh, but he has written some beautiful tunes. I even like Civil War. Uh, mm -hmm. He's written commercial. Scarlet Pimpernel. Kind of accessible tool yeah. tunes. And he did Jekyll, Jekyll and, Hyde. and Hyde, which had one or two good songs. This is the Je Je Jesse, can you bring some sanity into the discussion? <laughs> it's Frank Wildhorn. It's ice skating music. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Hugh Jackman. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, we get to him in a minute. But no, you. No, I really have nothing to add. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Hugh Jackman is coming back to Broadway in his one man show, Hugh Jackman Back on Broadway, I think it's called. Um, this seems to me probably the hottest ticket uh, this, this fall, you think? They raised the prices in previews. Michael, you look pained. You no, don't no, like Hugh I, Jackman? He, I am in love. He oozes charm, and there's nothing I want to see more than him just prancing around, singing whatever he wants. Me I don't too. even care if there's a theme. Mm. Uh, Patty Lapone uh, and the equally scary Mandy Patinkin are also doing a show together, and they're well matched because they're both genius, but they're Insane. well suited <laughs> temperamentally. They worked together before in Evita, which is a good segue. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's interesting, the two of them and Hugh Jackman, it's like, you know, Eve White and Eve Black. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the two shows. Um, uh, can you give us a sense of what Hugh's going to do in this show, Patrick? Is he just well, going to sing old Peter Allen songs in tight leopard pants? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> That's what he does I hope. at home. <laughs> um, I know that the show tried out in San Francisco, yep. and the critics liked it. 
What a surprise, a, San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit mixed, though. They, they sort of, and I think it's tightening. I think they, they, they're actually going to tighten the show. I don't know what the numbers are. I think, as Michael said, he could come out and sing anything mm. and probably succeed. Uh, Except but, the score for Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing the soliloquy from um, Carousel, I know that. That's right. There's that's no right. question, though, that it's, it's the buzziest show this fall and probably the only show that has a lot has a lot of buzz. All right, let's talk about a few of the, a few of the plays. Um, it's a much heavier season for plays than for musicals. Yeah, except we're not talking about the fall. Yeah, Wait, but not, what not, happened not, to Evita? Oh, well, oh, yeah, Evita uh, was Spring! <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Elena uh, we're not talking about the spring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, the plays, I, none of them sound all that interesting to me, frankly. But, oh, uh, I think some of them are going to be pretty good. All right, so what, uh, are you, what are you looking forward to? Which one? Uh, well, one of the ones that uh, I did not see it in Chicago, but I've read it and mm -hmm. spoken to the author is uh, called Chinglish. David Henry it's Wong's David play. David Henry Wong's uh, new play. And, you know, I if I try to tell you what I like about it, reading it, I'm going to scare everyone away from it. Well, try. Well, it's it's a third or more in Mandarin. Okay. Well. Goodbye, <laughs> happy audience. <laughs> With sir Let's, titles. Can you can take us to Hugh Jackman, okay. please. But it's really hilarious. And the sir titles or super titles basically play a comic role mm. because you and the audience don't really know what the people are saying. And then when you see what they're saying, you get there's a joke after the fact. It's quite well Wasn't constructed. This, didn't they do this in Thoroughly Modern Millie? <laughs> <laughs> Harry and well, Harris this, what's great about this, it's a Millie. sexy comedy, but it's, it's really about something. It's about <laughs> an American businessman in China who thinks, because he's American and a businessman, that he knows everything that's going on, and of course he knows nothing, uh. and he's schooled. So it's a farce. It's kind of a farce, right? Uh, but it's also serious about American, uh, you know, American seriousness about themselves mm. and uh, how the rest of the world has really progressed beyond their uh, obeisance to American values. Sounds, sounds interesting. Uh, from yeah. a pop cultural Farsing. point of view, which is my <laughs> shtick here, I'm interested in that two of the Sex and the City gals will be battling it out for the Tony. <laughs> Cynthia Nixon in Wit, which has never been on Broadway before. It's right. a Pulitzer uh. play about a woman with cancer. And Kim <laughs> Cattrall in Private Lives, another Private Lives. And she's actually getting raves. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And also, interesting to me, as a teen idol fan is uh, Andrew Garfield who is going to attract he's the new Spider-Man and he was in Social Network he's going to attract audiences a la Daniel Radcliffe for Death of a Salesman they'll be screaming girls screaming about Willie Loman oh right it's going to be <laughs> really bizarre because Philip Seymour Hoffman ostensibly right. is oh, but he's not yeah. in Spider-Man he's in the movie Spider-Man he's going to be in the play Death of the Salesman. movie Spider-Man yeah. yeah. and he, what's he playing in, in Death of a Salesman one of the Linda one of the sons, sons. Biff or <laughs> Lockheed yeah <laughs> will he be in the Spider-Man outfit because that's where I that's see the real synergy <laughs> Broadway at work. <laughs> but will, will Ricky Martin get screams in Evita? And, yeah, will he? Sure. Possibly from, 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 from older, from older, some older gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the same ones that are going to see the Judy Garland show. <laughs> but there, I, I, but the, I, no, I, I'm just saying that I don't <laughs> think that your two Sex and the City babes are going to win the Tony. I think it's going to be Nina Arianda in Venus and Fur, right. uh, which got really good reviews when it was off Broadway. And what is it? What it's is the play? It is a play that is also starring the guy who was in Journey's End. Thank you very much. By you David Dancing. Ives. Yeah. And it's a two-hander. And it's about a director and an actress who comes in late for an audition and they engage in this sort of psychological, sadistic, masochistic interplay. Oh, Susan, I'll take you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is very much like watching you two. Uh, I read the play. I didn't see the play. but Except it's... you need a, a fur bustier. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you I have one. Yeah, okay. It's Give a very me. smart, sexy play by David Ives yeah. and featured a star-making performance novel, in Nina Arianda that got her the role in Born Yesterday. Born, yeah. 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 Uh, that uh, didn't do all that well, but she got good reviews, and I think she's going to really set Broadway fire on this one. Um, speaking of this sort of um, yeah. um, sadomasochistic dynamic, I think some of this goes on uh, not only in Spell. <laughs> <laughs> no, in Seminar, Teresa Rebeck's new play starring Alan Rickman, and I believe in that he plays a writing teacher who has this kind of uh, sadomasochistic relationship with his students. Do we know much about this play? Yet? I, Alan Rickman, t t uh, Teresa Rebeck, that's fine by me. Yeah. Right. And isn't Teresa Rebeck writing a television show that one of us is Did going to be in? Did he pay you to say that? Yes. Yes, She's writing the I Miss show? Yeah. <laughs> Is this a setup? Oh. <coughs> no, we should say, full full disclosure, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Teresa Rebeck is writing Smash that people are looking forward to. It's a television show on NBC uh, about the making of a Broadway musical, fic fictional. But it begins in February, so we're not discussing it here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And uh, I, read the, I read the pilot, and they refer to 
how can you not if you do a show about Broadway to Michael Riedel of the of New Post? They <laughs> called me a little Nazi bastard. I had to sign a release from NBC that said, we can call you a little Nazi bastard and anything else we want to. <laughs> and then uh, Teresa emailed me and she said, would you play yourself on the show? So, you know, um, I don't like the limelight. I'm not an attention grabbing kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, sure. Now, so far, I haven't seen my sides, as we call them in the business. Or I think, <laughs> I think they're in German. <laughs> well, you still have I miss. <laughs> That's right. So uh, let's just talk about enough about me. We have um, four about, minutes about Smash, though, Patrick. What are the prospects for a, a mainstream television show about Broadway? I mean, with the success of Glee, has well, Broadway itself become more hmm. mainstream than ever before? Well, I would never have thought Glee would have been quite as successful and quite a phenomenon as it is. But I think it's that generation that was sort of raised on Disney animated musicals mm. uh, that sort of paved the way to them not thinking that musicals are for nerds and geeks <laughs> like us. Uh, <laughs> Boy, they, they bought a pig and a poke. <laughs> and also the fact that there's a lot of star quality and it's younger stars. You know, it used to be that it was only old stars who were washed up in Hollywood that would come and play Broadway. Yeah. Now, now it's attracting, it's a whole new ball game. So I think Broadway has moved into a different uh, category do you in agree? terms of do popular culture. Well, you are the popular culture king. Do you agree with this? Absolutely. I mean, Glee tapped into all of us who went to high school and were in the shows. I won supporting actor for Guys and Dolls. <laughs> <laughs> I was nominated for Adelaide. Adelaide. <laughs> for Adelaide, which I thought was a leading role. <laughs> but uh, uh, Smash has great pedigree with Spielberg producing and Mark Shaver. And Michael Riedel. Michael Riedel. You might be getting your sides. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I think it's a smash. I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And have you seen, do you know anything about Smash? Because the, 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 the pilot's been out. Did you, have you seen it? Yes, I have. Oh, give, give us your Oh, you've seen the pilot. I have seen oh, it. Oh, wow. And? Uh, it's very good. Yeah? Could it's, it benefit from? From you? Yeah. Uh, it could benefit from you not going to uh, <laughs> the day that they film your scene. Thank you very much. In the two minutes uh, we have left, may I go so far as to bring something up that you're not in, Mountaintop. <laughs> The, uh, the, the <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's playing Martin Luther King on alternate Tuesdays. <laughs> it has Samuel Jackson. It has and Angela, Angela Bassett. Bassett yeah. And it's directed by... Um, Kenny yeah. Leone and written by Katori Hall. Yeah, there are Katori actually Hall. Very two talented. plays uh, uh, by African-American... Right. <laughs> female black. Uh, yeah, well, there's there's uh, two, fly. two black women uh, represented on Broadway. Uh, another woman, a Chinese a Chinese American. You know, it's <sighs> there's more variety in the playwrights this year than we've seen in a well, long time. Just, Whether that pans out right. to anything. But I hear Diane Paulus is rewriting Mountaintop. To <laughs> <laughs> give it a little more context, happier ending. <laughs> 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 That's right. She's got a call, Martin Luther King's Mountaintop. But so people haven't seen this play, so tell us what it's about. Because it's uh, an interesting. interesting um, uh, I setup. think it's on the eve of Martin Luther King's assassination yes. and his relationship with a maid, quote, quote, unquote, yeah. a maid in his room, hotel room. In at, his hotel room. At the Lorraine Motel. At the Lorraine Motel. Skilled, yeah. Have you you've seen it or read it? I read it. Yeah. And uh, it's it's quite compelling. And there, it's hard to talk about it because something happens very quickly. Yeah, you don't want to give right. away the, right. the thing. So what, do, what do you know about stick fly? What? <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do we know anything? Well, I passed the marquee and it says, Alicia Keys <laughs> presents. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, she's not in it. No, 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 no. I, I agree with you, but this is how they've done it. This is a very sneaky thing to doing on Broadway when they've got celebrities who are producers, yeah. like Whoopi yeah. Goldberg and Bette Midler. From half the block away, you see Alicia Keys. You can't read presents <laughs> stick flies. So it looks as, of course, as if she's it. But it's, it's, it's about a, a it's about an African American family, an upper in Martha Martha's, Martha's Vineyard, Vineyard, upper class right. upper African American. Class. It's like family. guess who guess who's coming to get dinner, but back, but the other way. The other way. The other way. So right, somebody's yeah. bringing a white fiance or something to but it. But Diane Paulus so, is going to yeah. reverse it right back. So there we go. Um, all right, so we just have... Uh, oh, and Lissa Strata-Jones is coming. Is that coming in the fall? Yes, it, it is. is. Yes. Yeah. And that's a so, transfer from Off-Broadway, funny little show by Doug Carter. Doug Carter Bean. Risky, yeah, nice. I think. Uh, I mean, a risky investment. I mean, whether it And in high school, we not. learned to say yeah. Lysistrata-Jones. <laughs> Seriously, is that the pronunciation? <laughs> but you know what? That's However you say it, I think the Tony Committee, which I'm not on anymore, is going to go out of their way to not nominate Spider-Man for Best Musical just out of spite. And I think they're going to go for things like Lysistrata to Jones, nice work if you can get it. Maybe even Bonnie and Clyde, uh, and Newsies, Newsies yeah. uh, just to say, blank you, Spider Man, you caused us a lot of grief, even though you got a little bit better. Well, how did Spider Man cause the Tony people a lot of grief? They, well, they had to go to it. 
<laughs> oh, Michael. Uh, oh, uh, look I at the time. I, I, look I, at the time. I, I, think that, I think that may be the case, but you're going to see something interesting happen with Spider-Man. Now that they've kind of settled in, and they will be here for a while, alas, uh -huh. uh, despite my best efforts, I think they're going to try to become more part of a part of the Broadway community and not be so arrogant and turn their back and try to stand above it. Uh, you're going to see them trying to play nice with the Broadway people because they do want to get some nominations for that show. You mean they'll and have they, a booth uh, at the flea market? Is that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Broadway cast flea market. And they deserve it. What? They deserve <laughs> what? 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 They'll deserve Save your squawks for Imus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Funny panel, guys. Jesse Green from New York Magazine. Michael Musto from The Village Voice out with his compendium of columns fork on the left, knife in the back. And our old and short friend Patrick Pacheco. <laughs> oh, from, <and> short. <laughs> from, New York, from New York, one of the Los Angeles Times. You got a project you're working on, Patrick? You're writing something? Yes. Can you Nothing tell us? I can talk about. <laughs> well, you know, they all have something. I wrote I wrote a haiku recently, and I, <laughs> it's in my desk somewhere. Is that okay? Yes. Well, I always like it, though, when you write those pieces that start off kind of nice about a theater person. By the time you finished reading it, you dismembered the person, like poor old Arthur Lawrence. Oh, you have any of those? <laughs> Wait till you I'm see out. my thing on Imus. Uh, it's coming right <laughs> up. I've got a blog, Michael. I write a blog now. Patrick's Perspective. Oh, Cut my. this whole part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Oh, wow, are we out of time. All right. <laughs> That's funny. You have to leave that in. Good night, darling. <laughs> you can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can Twitter us. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.